the message this morning is twofold. And I'd first like to begin with a tribute to those that have served and are serving the United States of America. Some on fields that are on foreign soil and some are right here in our native country. I'd like to begin this short tribute by, by speaking of my grandfather. Uh, my family really doesn't have a history with the military. Uh, and I can give you two words for that. High blood pressure. My grandfather was not able to serve in World War II, but that was not enough for my grandfather. My grandfather picked up with my mom about two, and he moved my mom and my grandmother. He moved them to Wilmington, North Carolina, so that he could work in the shipyard. And I've heard my grandpa say on more than one occasion, he said, I couldn't do much but I did what I could do. And I've never forgotten those words. I know a lot of folks that have done much more. I had the privilege of pastoring a gentleman by the name of Tony Baker that attends Gastonia Firestone. Uh, Tony has been on the district board for many years. Uh, Tony's dad, after he had shipped overseas, uh, Tony's mom found out she was pregnant with Tony. And before Tony's dad ever made it back home, he died and is buried over in Luxembourg with about, with over 5,000 others that are buried there also. And I think of those folks that did what they could do, and that was to lay down their life for their country. And so the word that comes to my mind is the word sacrifice. Now, I told you a few minutes ago that the theme for the week was love. But folks, I'm here to tell you that sacrifice is not going to happen unless love is present. And so this morning, <clears throat> I first off would like for us to remember these that we know that have served. Several sitting right here in this room here this morning. I'd like us to be thankful for what they've done. I'd like for us to remember those that never came home from the battles. And what I would like for us to do is to spend a moment in prayer for those that are serving even now. And we have about four that have a connection to our church that are serving. The word is sacrifice. Giving without expecting much in return. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the commitment of men and women that feel a call to serve their country. Father, we come this morning and ask that you would be with each that have served, many that have given their lives through the years. We come and we offer a prayer of thanksgiving on their behalf and a blessing upon the family that has the memory of these. We come to you this morning, Father, praying also for those that are on the fields now, those that are serving to keep America's freedom protected. 
And Father, we come this morning and ask that you would be especially not only with them, but with their families. We know that sometimes they don't get to come home for holidays. A holiday is just another day of standing, guarding, and protecting. And so, Father, our prayer not only is for the soldier, but it is for the family. We ask that you would be with each of these. And, Father, let us not forget to remember these that are standing, protecting, even now. Father, be with us as we continue in our service this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 17, 18, and 19. With the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. Please take notice of those words. They have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. You know who that's talking about? People like us. Believing Gentiles. That's who Paul was addressing. Sometimes we get hurt by the circumstances around us. And sometimes what happens after we're hurt we begin to close off our minds and our hearts to God. You see these believing Gentiles that Paul was talking about, you see a lot of those came from pagan religions, idol worship. All of a sudden they were introduced to a man named Jesus. They grasped a hold of Jesus but when it came to living life, they didn't know how to do it. And so letters like Ephesians are written by the Apostle Paul to help the people understand that it's a decision that changes you, not just becomes a part of your ordinary life. A decision that changes you. The problem, they close their minds and harden their hearts. They close their minds and harden their hearts. They became insensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And they allowed their hearts to become. And the word in the Greek, instead of hardened, is actually the word calloused. It's kind of like you got a wound and you got a scab on it. So it's like underneath there's healing going on, but on the surface it's ugly. It's calloused. The best example in the Bible that I can think of to where this was going on is found in the book of Numbers, chapter 32. Children of Israel, God has given Moses the word to go to Mount Sinai, go to the top, meet him there. That's what Moses does. He takes along with him Joshua. And what we find is we find out during those 40 days that Moses and Joshua were on the mount. And a lot of people refer to Mount Sinai as the Mount of God. The people became disgruntled. It said they approached Aaron and they said, Build us a God. All these nations that we surrounding where we are at this moment, we, we see that they have gods that they can lay their hands on. They have gods that they can see. They have gods that they can literally lay things before. We want a God like that. Aaron says, bring me your gold and your silver. And Aaron is abroad. And as he told Moses, you know, I don't know what happened, but, you know, I threw these things into the fire and a calf came out the other side. But you know, the thought, the thought is this. 
when a person's heart becomes hard, it's not what sometimes we think, that they completely abandon God, they completely run away from God, they, they completely, you know, just renounce who Jesus is. No, that's not what the Bible teaches us, that the hardening of a heart is. Hardening of a heart comes from fear. Moses and Joshua had only been gone a few days. The people didn't know where they were going. They didn't know what they were doing. All they were doing was blindly following a man named Moses. And they had evidence before their eyes that God loved them and he was leading them. But yet God spoke through this man named Moses. And if he is gone, we don't know what we're doing. And it says that not only did Aaron build them an idol, it said that Aaron built them an altar to that idol. Folks, that is about the best biblical example that I can give you of what it means for a heart to become hardened. You know, a lot of times what we do to try to get beyond what a hard heart feels like is we try to satisfy the fear by doing things such as binging on food, going on budget-busting shopping spree, Sleeping long hours, alcohol, drugs, extramarital affairs, or we lose ourselves in 80-hour work weeks. Anything to help us deal with the fear and the circumstances, all the while God sends us churches that love us, families that unconditionally love us, sunsets, lightning bugs, cool rain on a summer day and other signs to show he is still there. And God will leave and intercede in our lives with Red Sea-like rescues. And when we don't know which way is up, he sends us hope like manna raining from the sky. But yet sometimes we still choose to go our own way and do our own thing. So how can we get back to that soft heart that loves and trusts Jesus with air free with our very life? Well, I believe there are two things. The first thing is I think that we need to not forget what God has done for us. Now, I'm going to turn there, but it's the book of Mark chapter 8. <clears throat> and in the book of Mark chapter 8 there is a little portion of scripture and the verses are 14 through 21 but I'm just going to read a few I, I'm, I'm not reading really in the context of what is trying to be said because Jesus is trying to teach them another lesson and then Jesus gets upset Verse 16. At this they began to argue with each other because they hadn't brought any bread. All right, they're going from one place to the next. Okay, keep this in mind. It's a day's journey in a boat, which how many of us would like to go out and spend a day in the boat on the water? I, I, I mean, just think about it. Instead of enjoying it, they're arguing because this one forgot to bring bread. No, you were supposed to bring bread. No, no, it was you that was supposed to bring the bread. And Jesus just gets ticked off. He gets upset. And then this is what he says. Why are you arguing about having no bread? Don't you know or understand even yet? Are your hearts too hard to take it in? 
Catch what he says there. Your, you have eyes, can't you see? You have ears, can't you hear? Don't you remember anything at all when I fed the 5,000 with five loaves of bread? How many baskets of leftovers did you pick up afterward? Twelve, they answered. And when I fed the 4,000 with seven loaves, how many large baskets of leftovers did you pick up? Seven, they said. Jesus is like, have you ever had to worry about bread? What has Jesus done for you? Has he ever done anything for you? If he has, do you think he'll do it again? Or do you think it was a one-time occurrence? Jesus is trying to drive home the point. If I did it once, will I not continue to do it because you are the object of my love? And then the second thing. Don't forget what you have done to God. Yet he still loves you. Disobedience hardens our heart, but confession softens it. Let us never forget that we are not perfect people. You know, I might have just hurt somebody's feelings just then. But you're not perfect. Neither am I. There's only been one perfect man and he got put on a cross for it. None of us are perfect. We're still a work in progress. That's why you make mistakes because you're not perfect. That's right. And never forget that when disobedience happens, Jesus stands by ready to hear our apologies. You know, I think a long time ago, the holiness movement, they missed that point. God stands there ready to forgive. He stands there ready to forgive. You know, when my kids, my grandkids come to see me, this is what they like to play with. One of the things. It's play -Doh. And here's the thing. Sometimes it's a while between their visits. And sometimes they hadn't been there in a while. And when they pull out the play doh, guess what? It's hard. They can't do a thing with it. And what do they do? They bring it to Pop. And they say, Pop, can you fix this? And you know, this is what I do. You just keep rolling and grabbing and pushing. And, and guess what happens? You might take a dab of water. But then it becomes moldable again. You see, when we remember that we're not perfect, but yet Jesus loves us anyway, it makes it easier after we <coughs> totally blow it to come back to our Father and say, here I am again. Take and fix me up again. You know, I know a lot of you wonder, Todd, where, where do you get the ideas for sermons? Well, that's easy. I just say the Holy Spirit because that's the answer. 
is God. It comes from God. God uses the Holy Spirit. But a lot of times, the Holy Spirit uses the things that are going on around me. A lot of times, I come home from vacation and I've got some kind of weird story to tell you. And if you listen to the From the Heart that come out on Thursday, you get a glimpse of what it's like to travel with Becky. But as far as the sermon goes, this was not one of those sermons. You know, so many, many people are looking for answers. But the answer to our problems right now and always are not found in a particular party or ideology. The answers we need are not found in unmotivated acts of love <coughs> the answer is found in intelligent people is not found in intelligent people that know medicine the answers we need today are from Jesus so as we bring this to a close this morning may we remember the sacrifices made by many so that we could live in freedom Remember also that a Savior came and because of love died in our place on the cross so that we could be free from the bondage of sin. Remember John 3, 16, for God so loved. Now, Tuesday night, if you look at the Bible study, we're going to talk about that word in that context. But God so loved the world. We want to thank all that has served our country. We want to thank everyone for their sacrifice. But thanks most of all to a father that gave us the gift of salvation through his son. Sacrifice is not possible unless love is present. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the day. I ask that you would be with us now as we continue through this day. But Father, let us remember the depths of which we are loved. When we're hurting, when we're in fear, when we don't know which way to turn. Lord, we read in the book of Ephesians where it says that even Christians can come to a point where they close their minds off and they harden their hearts. Father, let us not do that. Father, let us not believe the lies of Satan, but let us rejoice in the love of a Savior that died so that we might have life. And not just any life, but it says in John 10, 10, that we might have life to the fullest. Father, as we make our way from this place today, our prayer is that you would help us to remember what July 4th is all about. And that we would celebrate those that have given so that we might be free. But Father, let us not forget the love of the Savior who despite our faults and failures chooses to love us anyway. Thank you, Father, for this time. Be with us as we go in Jesus' name. Amen.